Hi, my name is John Downing. I'm a limnologist and aquatic ecologist, and this is session 15 of a series of modules that I've put together to teach limnology and aquatic ecology. This one has to do with the lentic benthos. So what are the lentic benthos? So first of all, you learned earlier, hopefully, if you've been following these sessions, that the word lentic means water that is n does not have a, um, a directional and continuous motion to it. So this has to do with ponds and lakes. So the lentic benthos. So what are the benthos? Benthos are organisms that live on the bottom or associated with a substratum of some kind. And these can be along in any place within a lentic ecosystem. And Earlier in earlier sessions, you may have learned what the various zonations, zonation, or zones uh, of a lentic ecosystem are. But um, the benthos can inhabit this surface or beneath the surface, um, uh, or the surfaces of things like plants and rocks and cobble um, throughout the substrate-oriented area of an aquatic system. This is in contrast with the pelagic zone which is the domain of the plankton. So we've just looked at the phytoplankton and the zooplankton. Now we'll look at those organisms that live associated with some sort of substratum. That's what the benthos are. Now, there are some things you probably already know about benthos. If you're a fly uh, uh, fishing enthusiast, then um, you know that animals that live on the bottom are the foods of uh, f foods of th th that those fish eat. And so when you're fly fishing, you try to mimic these animals, these benthic organisms, to use something um, as a lure that looks like the kind of uh, organism they eat. Now, interestingly, we call these flies. Um, and uh, and um, in fact, many of the organisms that live in the benthic zones are insects, although not adult insects, probably larval uh, insects of some kind, and we'll see a few of those as we go through this session. Um, you sometimes fish with worms. You might ask yourself why you do this. Worms are terrestrial organisms. Well, there are benthic organisms that look a lot like worms. In fact, similar color, although rather smaller. And that's why uh, f uh, fishing with worms is pretty effective. Mind you, my um, my children and I uh, have found that fish will bite on almost anything, so it's not exactly diagnostic. Now you've probably eaten crayfish. This is an, um, an epibenthic organism, the crayfish, and the, um, the ones you've eaten may come from some place like Louisiana or um, other places like that, but these are organisms that live on the bottom. These are benthic organisms, in fact macrobenthic organisms that probably you understand something about. Maybe if you've been around freshwater beaches, you've seen some big shells and some little shells. And um, these are obviously not organisms that live in the pelagic zone. These are benthic organisms, and um, these shells will be um, the shells of things like gastropods and, um, and pelecipods, um, the um, clam-type things or mussel-like organisms and, um, and snails. Um, so you know already that those kinds of organisms live in aquatic systems. And perhaps you've heard that CSI, or crime scene investigators, look at insect colonization of bodies in lakes and rivers to determine the time since immersion. And this is because um, they know quite a lot about um, insect larvae and um, the, the rate at which um, bodies are colonized by benthic organisms. So benthic organisms already sort of fit within your knowledge base, I hope, but hopefully we'll learn a lot more about them. The objectives that I have for this session are to get you to learn about the diversity of organisms that make up the benthos, and then learn how the benthic organisms live and function in aquatic systems. And we'll look at images and some videos and things like that so that you can get a, a sense of this. Um, I'd like you to also understand the typology and the different distinctions of benthic animals. I've already used the word macrobenthos and also epibenthos, um, so we'll learn something more about that. I'd also like you to learn how knowledge of benthic biodiversity contributes to lake typology, distinguishing different kinds of lakes from one another, and also something about the spatial distributions of benthic organisms and their biomass in lentic ecosystems. So those are my objectives for this particular session.
Now, we're going to take a bit of a functional analysis of benthos, and uh, the reason for that is that ecosystems are structured by the flow of energy and materials, and um, understanding and management rely on trophic information. Um, the benthic habitat is definitely different from the planktonic habitat, and I, and I think that's worth thinking about. The benthic habitat is usually pretty dark, unless it's in the shallow littoral zone. It's also cool, rarely attaining the high temperatures of the epilimnion. Sometimes it's anoxic or anaerobic or hypoxic, not quite enough oxygen, and so organisms that live in that kind of environment need to be adapted to low oxygen conditions. It's very substrate oriented and it's built basically on detrital food, food webs and these dominate and that is the 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 the, uh, um, the use of detritus or dead or decaying or decomposing material is uh, really a very important part of many benthic environments this contrasts with the epilimnetic planktonic habitat in that the epilimnetic planktonic habitats usually are fairly light they tend to be warmer they usually are well oxygenated and definitely these organisms wander about and are not oriented toward any particular substratum. Also, food resources tend to be more living material and less, um, less detrital. There are lots of taxa comprising the benthos, and we'll sort of walk through them one by one. But in general, these include the protozoa, very small things, the periphera, which are the sponges, the solenterata, platyhelminthes, or the flatworms, the nematodes, tardigrades, bryozoa, annelids, or various kinds of worms, ostracods and other sorts of crustacea, the mollusks, and the aquatic insects. And so we can just kind of walk through those. First, let's, we've already talked quite a lot about the protozoa as we discuss these with respect to the um, plankton. These are among the least understood benthic organisms, but frequently extremely abundant because of their very small size. They're particularly abundant in areas of oxidation and decomposition, and in fact, a lot of these are quite important in sewage decomposition. They're, you, they're uh, harnessed in, uh, very well in um, sort of activated sludge systems and breaking down um, sewage so that it can be purer before it's released. A few species can tolerate almost completely anaerobic conditions, and these um, organisms are dominated by ciliates and rhizopods. And um, rhizopods are um, thing, the root foot kinds of organisms, and uh, that, things like the amoebae, amoebae and so on. Uh, species are often segregated vertically by oxygen and food requirements, depending on what they eat, um, and they tend to show very high summer maxima due to high temperature and abundant food. And I won't show you much more about these because you already know quite a lot about them. You've seen didinium and you've seen paramecium um, in action in uh, previous sessions. Next group um, I'd like to talk about are the periphera and these are sponges actually and you may not be aware that there are freshwater sponges. They're quite different. They don't make the big sort of fluffy sponge that uh, is so famous for sponge divers going for in marine ecosystems. Uh, but most of the sponges are marine, but some are freshwater. Um, they um, create structural sorts of materials called spicules and reproductive gemules, and those are shown in the figures over at the far right uh, in the image that you're looking at. And they have little flagella that create a filtering currents that trap bacteria and detrital material out of the water. And um, you see one of them up here at the top. This is one, and I'll show you some other ones um, uh, from the Chesapeake River in just a second. They have, uh, they're very brightly green uh, colored, some of them, and this is because they have symbiotic zoochlorelli algae. And these are important to them, but they're not critical. They can live normally without them. Um, the periphera in general and freshwaters are encrusting on substrates. They require uh, large amounts of silica because these spicules are often um, uh, built out of um, silica and they exist mainly in waters with moderate to high alkalinity or dissolved materials. They live in oligotrophic to mesotrophic waters. Um, the thought is that in, if you get into eutrophic systems, there's so much particulate matter that it clogs their filtering mechanism. They're usually minor components of the benthos, but quite interesting anyway. And uh, um, I can show you, a, a, I think, a small video here of 
um, that someone has taken and put on YouTube, and you can go and watch it in person. There you see underwater. This is in the, uh, I believe, in the Chesapeake. Um, sorry, in the, uh, in one of the one of the rivers in the uh, draining into the Chesapeake. There's some more encrusting. Um, uh, these are macroscopic, of course, you know, so it's a pretty big thing. That may be four to eight inches across. Here's some more. Um, and now you notice that those don't have the zoochlorelli. They may be a little bit deeper. Here is another encrusting um, sponge. Let's see what else we see. This is obviously on some kind of a wreck in the river. There are some other sponges there distributed, again, encrusting the surface. Another one there down to the lower right. Uh, some suckers hanging around. Catfish. Hang on. Rather unafraid catfish. And some more encrusting sponges. Very interesting filter feeders, members of the encrusting benthos. The next group I'd like to talk about are a little bit more active than the um, than the periphera. These are the cylindrates. And you may know of jellyfish uh, in marine ecosystems. There are a lot more marine uh, cylindrates than there are freshwater ones, but there are a couple of important ones. Uh, and these would be the hydroids um, as shown there at the top and Craspita custa, which is, I think, the only genus of freshwater jellyfish that's known. Um, uh, so the... the um, uh, and uh, the freshwater jellyfish in North America, I believe, is an exotic, um, uh, probably introduced back in the 1960s. Now, the really interesting thing about the cylindrates is that they have um, ep epi uh, epidermal cells that contain cells called nematocysts, and these are used to stun prey. And I have been stung by jellyfish plenty, and let me tell you, it is a very stunning um, experience. Um, they're, um, uh, the nematocysts, uh, when they touch uh, skin, are uh, very, um, <laughs> well, they're really stunning. They're really, they burn like crazy. Um, and they do the same thing to their prey. So, um, so the, basically the prey are stunned and then food particles move to the mouth with tentacles. There are also some green hydra that have symbiotic algae. Um, their abundance is usually low. They're kind of a minor component of benthic biomass, but really interesting and can be very important um, zooplankton predators. I mean, the first thing, let's, let's have a look at the, um, uh, sort of take a dive um, and have a look at Craspidacusta, the freshwater jellyfish. And this is kind of a longish video. We'll sort of um, cut it short. This is in Fish Lake in uh, St. Joseph County, Michigan, obviously. And we're going to dive through a whole bot bunch of, uh, looking at it, uh, uh, it's Myriophyllum spicatum, probably an aquatic uh, macrophyte. I think this was just put on here for um, ambience a little bit to get you into it feeling like you're
top at the top. These are uh, native and they're much more common. And you can see these stinging, stinging tentacles. The uh, animal is rooted here, attached, and waves these tentacles out. And in a second, you'll see uh, clodocerin come by um, and be stung. Here comes the clodocerin. And these nematocysts are pretty nasty, as I indicated. Aye. And then the tentacles pull in, pull a clodocerin in, and then the animal is um, ingested over time. The next group I'd like to look at are the platyhelminthes, or the turbularia, and um, they're quite sweet. They're uh, nice looking little things. You can see their little eye spots are a little bit cross-eyed, and some people are real enthusiastic about planaria. Um, I really doubt planaria cross um, streets, but they move by um, action of abundant cilia all over their bodies, and they eat small invertebrates and detrital material. They're in, uh, in fact, let's let's just have a look at this one moving around. It is in flatworms oh well. That we first see bilateral yes, we don't really need that. I just want you to watch them move along the, um, this is moving obviously on a um, glass surface. Here it is going across a plant surface. Um, uh, they can eat things like um, snails, um, stoneflies, mayfly nymphs, amphipods, oligochaetes, and you know, smallish invertebrates and detrital material. Most of them live in the littoral zone, and you can see this one sort of crawling along in the littoral zone. Um, they don't fluctuate much in annual abundance. They sort of uh, resorb their tissue. They uh, more or less decrease their um, decrease their size rather than changing a lot in abundance. And um, they're not abundant in moving or turbulent waters. You can kind of see that they would be rather. This one's having a feast on some dead uh, animal of some kind. Uh, so they um, and uh, they're not very ab abundant in moving or turbulent water, mostly found in ponds and so on. And they have one really interesting trait, and I'm going to show you a really silly video that I found. Um, but the trait is that they can be chopped up into pieces and completely regenerate. They're quite amazing. And this is, and I will turn the sound on, to, on for this because it's really quite funny, I find. And you can watch what they're doing. Um, I know, it's a horrible thing. And now, now, if you understand, you're seeing that both ends of this thing are regenerating themselves. Oh, no, now it's regenerated. Now they're, they're cutting it into many pieces. <laughs> it's a very exciting <laughs> narrative. Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> this disgusting display. <laughs> Anyhow, they're they're pretty amazing little animals. So um, next, the nematodes. These are roundworms. They're not. Ter I mean, they are very interesting. They're significant components of the benthos. They're found in all kinds of uh, types of freshwater habitats. Their taxonomy is kind of poorly understood. Um, so not much is known about them. So um, and they're really kind of hard to analyze. So we unfortunately don't know as much about the nematodes as uh, would be helpful. They have a diversity of feeding habits, though. A lot of them are detritivores, eating dead plant and animal material. There are also are herbivores with specialized chewing uh, mouth parts that help in eating plants, and they'll actually burrow into the plants and hollow them out. Some are uh, predaceous, and they have seizing, rasping, macerating mouth parts, and eat other kinds of nematodes. They'll also eat protozoans, tardigrades, and oligochaetes, other kinds of benthic organisms. They live primarily near the surface of the sediments, um, probably due to oxygen requirements. But they will hit really high seasonal maxima in, uh, in abundance in the, in the neighborhood of you know, hundreds of thousands per square meter, uh, often in the um, winter or early spring. So nematodes, pretty important, um, not as understood as we might like, but they'll often gulp material, um, those that are deposit feeding, and pass it through their bodies, and they process sediments um, very much like a worm does. Another kind of organism that you may run across uh, in benthic uh, environments are bryozoans. And in Greek, this means moss animals. They're 
rarely of quantitative importance, but I often get calls about these things because people are usually convinced. In fact, go ahead and look for uh, Brian Zoans on YouTube and look at a couple of these things. People are often convinced that they're uh, life forms from another planet, but they're basically little budding uh, organisms like you see there with little sorts of um, a cil with a ciliated corona that directs particles even as big as microcrustaceans like little clodocerans and so on um, into their mouth so they feed their colonies are often big gelatinous messes um, looking so sometimes people call them uh, um, water brain because they look kind of like this awful looking mushy brain thing and I'll show you a couple more pictures of them um, they, um, their reproduction is uh, asexual and it can be very fast and they can form ball like colonies and sort of with a diameter of maybe a quarter meter um, and again go ahead and look on YouTube uh, for these things they're kind of amazing um, then they're also a pretty uh, important source of, of food for fish and their colonies um, because they're sort of um, open matrices of material form the substrate for many other uh, kinds of invertebrates including insect larvae so they can be important habitats and here's another one here's a you can see kind of why they call them water brains in this upper image here it's a great big round thing this is a diving knife to give you scale um, they also will sort of encrust surfaces I've seen them actually more like this in the systems uh, oligotrophic systems I've worked in um, but um, bryozoans <laughs> often uh, bring calls into limnologists, so you may find them interesting. If you run across them, you can amaze your neighbors and friends. Tardigrades, um, they're not of really great quantitative importance, but they're really cute and they're really interesting, and you can see what they look like. And These are called water bears, and here's why they're called water bears. They kind of look like bears. They sort of walk around like bears, and I'll show you a little um, a video about how amazing they are. They're really quite incredible. They can stand desiccation and uh, very extreme temperature ex uh, extremes. They mostly live in the littoral zone. They also live in that sort of interstices amongst sand grains and beaches and even in drops of water on terrestrial mosses. Um, so you'll find them in terrestrial systems too. They're, they they have hooks on their feet and sort of this pawing motion, uh, uh, locomotion that make them this is why we call them water bears. They live by charmingly sucking the fluids out of plants and a few animals, things like nematodes and so on, those that don't eat them. Um, they're almost all females, like the Clodocera are. Um, they reproduce by parthenogenesis, and they produce males in low numbers from time to time. They're usually kind of abundant in during extreme periods in temperate, um, um, temperate uh, aquatic systems, usually between January and May. They can survive under very extreme uh, conditions. And this funny video from Animal Planet, I'll, I'll show you in a minute, makes a great deal out of this. They're usually preyed on by amoeboid protozoans and predaceous nematodes, but they're really quite cool organisms. So here's a, a little bit of a video. Normally, this tiny animal waddles around on its four pairs of plump little legs sucking the juices out of mosses and lichens. Charming, not also animals. But when the going gets tough, how can the cute and squishy water bear be tougher than a grizzly bear? The water bear is the most extreme survivor on the planet because That's when a the conditions animation. get That's... tough, this animal effectively curls up and dies. Well, it doesn't die, obviously, but... It loses 99% of the water in its body and enters a state of suspended animation. Let's say a water bear starts getting too cold. It'll shrink down, retract all its legs, and shut down all systems until conditions improve. Once they're in this state, they're practically indestructible. Imagine if you were as tough as a water bear. If things started getting too cold, all you have to do is curl up and lose virtually right, all right, the water. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but you get the. Uh, they, they've actually sent them out in space. Freezing solid. Would maybe be they'll no come to that in a, to a second. Human water bear. Water bears can survive temperatures as low as minus 328 degrees Fahrenheit. Extreme heat would be no trouble either. Water bears have survived a scorching 303 degrees. 
Imagine if a human was exposed to radioactive material. You could be 150 miles downwind from a nuclear blast and still get a lethal dose of fallout. That's about 500 rontgens, the units used to measure radiation. The indestructible water... Yeah, in any case, they can they can um, survive really a lot of extreme conditions. In fact, they've taken them out in space and they've lived. And this, I think this video goes on to try to suggest that water bears may have come from outer space or something like that. But that's the usual kind of stuff you run across on YouTube. So tardigrades, really cute, really interesting. Um, can And they... Uh, they exist in very extreme environments because they can survive it quite well. They're quite amazing things. The next thing that I'd like to talk about would be the annelids or worms. And they uh, these are three different groups that are important. And uh, oligochaetes, which, um, well, they actually, um, the first two groups are distinguished based on the amount of sort of hairs they have or CT they have on them. Um, and um, the oligochaetes, oligo means rare. And this we know because we talk about rare food is you as oligotrophic okay so um oligo is very rare and they, these things generally live in fine sediments there are a few species that are extremely tolerant of pollution uh, like tubifex the tubifex worm that can um can exist in amazingly uh, low oxygen conditions and in fact we sometimes call them sewage worms because of that these things will feed on detritus and processed material oligochaetes are um, another oligochaete you probably know is an earthworm that's another oligochaete and they live in very similar kinds of ways and over here you see an oligochaete polychaete of course means many hairs right so polychaete uh, many hairs here's a polychaete over here um, they have many sorts of important hairs that these are almost all exclusively marine and but I'll show you freshwater one in a little bit um, and they're usually found in freshwater systems pretty close to the sea they feed on zooplankton and other particles they're really important in uh, benthic uh, ecosystems of marine environments um, then um, uh, the leeches are the other group of annelid type worms that you know something about and probably you're um, uh, keen on the idea that they are maybe you're interested in the fact that they suck blood they don't all they're mostly predators or scavengers but if you look for videos on these things you'll mostly find blood sucking ones that because they're so horrific or something they're even horror films that have been uh, made about um, leeches of course um, but uh, the blood sucking species can live up to you know a couple hundred days on one blood meal so that's a very efficient way of living most in fact are predators or scavengers um, and I've seen these things come out actually on beaches and hunt for insects at night they're quite amazing um, the predators uh, they're predators and they eat oligochaetes amphipods chironomid car larvae various sorts of insect larvae and so on and they're most abundant in eutrophic to hyper eutrophic lakes so you rarely find them although you do find them in sort of the literal zone of oligotrophic lakes but they're rarer there they, than they are in poor water qualities so I can show you some here here's a little video of um, an oligochaete doing a sort of wormy bit um, scraping material off the surfaces surface of um, I think that's a freshwater alga or a small vascular plant that's what that one looks like here's a, here's a polychaete polychaete you can see it's sort of functioning it's many keta these uh, sort of uh, this corona here of material is used in feeding and then here's a, a predatory leech that's looking around for insect foods okay so these are this particular one is not a blood sucking uh, leech um, but they are pretty effective predators and these are macroscopic organisms Well, there are miscellaneous crustacea of varying kinds, and we've talked about a lot of these sorts of things, the copepods and clodocera, um, uh, when we talked about the um, uh, when we talked about the plankton. There are also are ostracods. Ostracods are these sort of uh, seed-looking things that spin around, um, and those are also found in the benthos. The, um, also, um, in temporary ecosystems, there are some really fun kinds of organisms um, called the Eubranchiopoda, and I'll show you one video of that in just a second. Um, but also, clearly, on the missids, we mentioned this before in the last session on zooplankton, that um, 
there are mycids and amphipods that are benthic organisms that come up into the water column and, um, and feed. Um, there are also some isopods. Isopods would be sort of like a sow bug kind of thing. And some decapods, the crayfish and freshwater shrimps and prawns that you see. These are all very important kinds of organisms um, in, in uh, benthic uh, ecosystems. And um, I just want to show you this really um, a cute, uh, nice video, if I can get back to it here. Um, nice video from Julie Wignall from Wonders of the West. Five million years before marine reptiles such as the ichthyosaurs existed, or before dinosaurs ever came on the scene, there appeared a tiny little creature with some ingenious methods of adaptation. Called triops, or more commonly, tadpole shrimp, these tiny little crustaceans are a distant relative of the trilobites. But unlike the trilobite, or the ichthyosaurs, or dinosaurs, which all went extinct, the triops can still be found today, living right here in Nevada. Uh, it's right here in any As system that dries up, basically. As come to the desert, so. small pools of warm water are created on what was barren land. Protected in the ground beneath for decades may be the tiny eggs of the triops, which have waited for just this perfect opportunity to hatch. Triops have a short lifespan of only 20 to 40 days. With no time to spare, once the eggs are hydrated with water, they split open to release a developing embryo. Within hours, they develop into a larval stage and quickly move on to become young adults. The name triops refers to the three eyes of the animals. Two of the eyes are used to look for enemies and food, while the third eye is used to look for light. Another interesting thing about triops is, is that they breathe through their feet. Fish have gills on the sides of their heads, but triops have gills on their legs. As triops grow quickly, they molt, which is when they shed their outer exoskeleton, exposing a larger exoskeleton underneath. As true natural recyclers, triops eat their molted shells, leaving nothing to waste. These are very cool um, organisms, and they get quite big, actually, and uh, they look kind of a lot like a horseshoe crab when you see them. Um, and also, the fairy shrimp are shown up here. Those will virtually explode after um, a wetting of a, of a, um, uh, of a dried-up uh, environment. The next group that I'd like to talk about with respect to the Atlantic benthos would be the mollusca, and there are two main kinds of mollusks, and you're probably already aware of this because you've seen clam-like things and you've probably also seen snail-like things, and here you see some of them over to the right-hand side of this image. Um, these at the tops, there are gastropods, and gastropod means mouth foot, and what that means is that they usually, that they have some kind of radula that scrapes away material from surfaces, and if you have an aquarium, you've probably seen these things in action. Um, and they um, are very good at scraping surface films. So they are benthic organisms that are uh, oriented toward various surfaces and tend to clean off algae, detrital material, etc. from those surfaces. Now there are two kinds of snails. There are the prosobranchs and the pulmonates. And um, the prosobranchs uh, have, uh, they, their respiration or their, uh, they obtain oxygen via gills and the pulmonates have lungs. but. Um, some uh, some of the lungs uh, the lungs sometimes are so small and well articulated that they don't ever really need to surface to to get oxygen. So some so there are two different kinds of gastropods or snails, um, and they are um, very good at scraping surfaces. The other group that's really important are the pelecypods, and there are uh, several uh, there are actually two main types of uh, at least in North America there are two main types of of um, of uh, pelecypods or mussels, freshwater mussels or inland water mussels, and these would be the unionids and the spherids. And um, it, so the unionids are um, uh, these larger um, animals that you see that look like great big clams. A lot of people call them clams, they're mussels. And then the spherids would be these little tiny things, they're fingernail clams. And those are more, uh, they live sort of immersed down in sediments oftentimes, whereas these unionids or these um, uh, native uh, freshwater mussels uh, tend to be part way, um, uh, part way into the sediments and move along using a large sort of muscular foot. And um, they also have very interesting life history that we'll talk about in a minute. At least in North America anyway, we have some other kinds of uh, pelecypods that are getting to be problematic and these would be exotic uh, pelecypods are exotic mussels, and these would be the zebra 
type mussel um, and the uh, Asian clam. And these are, um, uh, ha are invasive exotic organisms causing a great deal of trouble in the uh, ecosystems of North America, but maybe not elsewhere. And, um, you know, so there are invasive species as well. The, um, the, the uh, native large mussels are really interesting. They have a very fun life history. So I thought it might be interesting for you to see a little bit about it. So I've um, I borrowed a YouTube video for you to watch here. Um, and um, they'll explain what's going on with the freshwater mussels. These things are quite mussels amazing. Freshwater mussels have an amazing life cycle that depends on fish. See, they're it muscular foot. It begins when a male mussel releases sperm into the water, which is siphoned into the female mussel to fertilize eggs. Mussel larvae develop inside the female until they reach a parasitic stage that requires a fish to serve as a mobile nursery. The tiny mussel larvae must attach to the gills or fins of the right type of fish in order to continue growing. Some female mussels have special adaptations to attract fish close enough to receive their larvae. This mussel displays a lure that mimics a small fish but is actually part of her own body. The lure attracts a predator fish to the mussel, increasing the chances that her offspring will be able to latch onto a suitable host. The fish host provides food for the developing mussel larvae. Within a few weeks, this parasitic stage ends and transformed mussel larvae drop off the fish as juvenile mussels. If they land in a suitable habitat, the cycle can continue. Terrific, terrifically interesting animals. Very important and the second most endangered group of um, benthic organisms, or actually second made most endangered group of aquatic organisms in the world. The most endangered group are, would be the crayfish. There are very few species, and several of them are at risk of extinction. But the next group I'd like to talk about are the aquatic, are the insects. And um, actually, you don't see very many, well, with a few exceptions, like the uh, hemiptera or water bugs. You don't see um, uh, too many of these that exist as adults in aquatic ecosystems. They're mostly larvae or nymphs, uh, very, very few adults. These are extremely important in most benthic communities. In fact, there are people who, off, who would suggest that they are, make up the greatest part of biomass in many kinds of aquatic ecosystems. Um, they belong to many different taxonomic and trophic groups, and um, they um, include, that includes the beetles. Here's a coleoptera larva. The trichoptera, this is a caddisfly larva. You see its uh, case here. This ephemeroptera, these would be mayflies. Um, and uh, they often um, uh, emerge in profusion. It's quite amazing. There are lots of dipterans, including things like um, mosquitoes, chironomids, simulids, uh, black flies, sorry. Um, and um, they're often very abundant also in the, their uh, larvae are very abundant in the benthos frequently. The odonates, um, there are two different kinds of odonates, uh, odonata that uh, are important in fresh waters. That would be the damselflies, and the other one is the dragonflies, dragonfly being larger. And these, as you'll see in a minute, are really quite remarkable predators. Uh, there are the hemiptera, these are the water bugs. These are, in fact, pinching, um, uh, pinching uh, appendages. And there, I've been actually uh, pinched by one of these, and it's a pretty nasty bite you can get from them. Uh, they're um, uh, very, these are very strong uh, appendages. The Plecoptera, these are the stoneflies. They exist in pretty clear waters and are uh, pretty um, important in sort of um, trout growing waters and things. Also, the Megaloptera and Neuroptera, Neuroptera, also these are called uh, Helgramites, are important. And there are even some Lepidopterans or water moths that are um, important constituents of the insect larval, uh, insect community in benthic ecosystems. These are often major sources of fish food. Uh, while they live in the system, while they're beginning to emerge um, uh, into their adult stage in uh, in the open air, uh, and um, and even afterward, they're often taken at the surface by fish. So very major sources of fish food. They may be very highly specialized to very specific habitats. And certainly, there are lots of examples of this. Certain kinds of organisms that live only really in specific sorts of places. The simulids or black flies. Um, end up living very well at the outlets of lakes where the lakes flow into streams and, and so on. Lots of different special adaptations. 
And I can I show you a couple little videos here that I think are fun to see, just to give you a sense of what these things do. Here's a dragonfly um, feeding. And now a dragonfly, I used to actually have a pet dragonfly that I kept in my laboratory, and um, I fed it minnows. And you may think that's an amazing thing, because minnows tend to be pretty big. But you'll see how this thing works. It has like a, almost like a, a, a great big cash drawer that goes out and can it can reel back in and pull in prey. And you can watch that in this video here. Let's have a look at this guy. It's also narrated. That has developed a stereoscopic view is the dragonfly naiad. It needs it to calculate distance with high precision, or otherwise its attacks will fail. And you can see some slow motion pieces of these. These are water boatmen. And there you hear you'll see the slow motion. Look at this major adaptation for pulling in that organism. It gets loose, this particular one. This insect lives as larva for months, sometimes even years. Therefore, it can accumulate toxins in its Look body and die. Look at that incredible modified jaw. It's just amazing. I would not like to meet one of these things if it were somewhere around my size. They're remarkable in their abilities to grab a hold of things. I'll show you this whole sequence of it eating this um, this little water boatman and then it moves on to attacks on larger organisms than that one. They're, they're remarkable predators. Almost done. Its presence is convenient to us because it destroys mosquito larvae. There it is. Yeah, it'll feed on mosquito larvae. Eats a lot of them very fast. They're terrific. Watch this thing go. Can't quite get enough. If you watch this not in slow motion, you almost don't even see what it's doing. Now here we go, it's gone after a fish. Ah, that's an amazing thing. This is another kind of dragonfly naiad. It is bigger and stronger. It can even catch fishes. Sometimes. I think there's a reason they call them dragonflies, no? I don't want to make you sick, so we can move on. It gets even more gruesome from here on out. Um, there are another, this other group, um, let's see, we can look at um, Chironomids. They're kind of interesting. Oh, more brilliant music. Um, I just want you to see with here, there's one of them grazing along. These are non-biting midges, what you probably would call gnats. Um, and their larvae live in water, and they feed on a variety of different things. Some live in the sediments. Some live uh, on plants, and this one is epiphytic, feeding along a plant surface. You can see it filling its gut pretty rapidly. They graze really fast. Some of these that you'll see uh, down in the deep sediments are bright red, and they do contain um, hemes um, so that they can uh, hold on to oxygen better, very much like you have in your own blood. So they'll be bright red. Sometimes we call them blood worms, but they do nothing about your blood. It's just that they look as if they have blood. So the non-biting midges is really important. Uh, Trichoptera are the caddisflies and look at this thing. It looks like it's carrying a lot of junk on it. And basically all of these kind of form, well, most of them form some sort of, of a case, uh, p perhaps for protective reasons and so on. And they and they're, here you see their appendages up front. 
hey, let's see what this thing looks like as it moves along. Um, it's pasted together or spun together this um, this case and it drags it along and um, some of them build cases that they actually use for filter feeding and um, but uh, and oftentimes actually the trichoptera you can basically key them out based on the stuff that they've built their case out of. Some of them are small pebbles, some of them are pieces of wood, some are pieces of vegetation and so on. Very interesting animals. And over here are some caddis flies that build and this this particular one I think is called something like river socks. What you're seeing here is a series of nets um, that have been built by caddis flies that they use and these will tend and water will flow into them and the particles are then caught in this net and then are ingested by the trichopter and by the caddis fly. Lots of interesting ways of making a living in the benthos. There are type, different types of benthic organisms, and we've talked about them a little bit. And, and maybe let's start over on this right-hand side. There are various distinctions that are made in the benthos. Um, one is a distinction of size, and there are three main categories, size categories of benthic organisms. There are the microbenthos, the myobenthos, and the macrobenthos. I think micro and macro are pretty well self-explanatory. They're the little ones and the big ones and clearly things like freshwater mussels and so on and crayfish and so on these are macrobenthic organisms microbenthic are things you don't see very well maybe like the protozoans and some of the small crustaceans the myobenthos are those things in the middle uh, some examples would be um, caddis flies and um, uh, chironomids and um, um, oh and certainly uh, well I'm not sure whether mac whether the Odinates, the dragonflies, would be macro or micro. They're pretty big and pretty functional. Another distinction we make in the benthos is where they live. So we'll talk about things like literal benthos and profundal benthos, depending on the zone in which they're found. And often they're very different communities in the literal zone, the profundal zone, in the, um, in the, um, oh, at the margins of the literal zone, um, and so on. And then there are different kinds of ways of living. There are the endobenthos, those that live in the substrate, and there are the epibenthos, things that live on the surface. And we saw the, a chironomid that was living on the surface and working away uh, along the surface of a plant. Um, also, something like a gastropod or, a, or a, um, a snail would tend to live on the surface of things, whereas other things are burrowing and, uh, and working their way um, through the sediment, things like fingernail clams. Um, uh, Hutchinson, uh, G. Evelyn Hutchinson, a very important uh, limnologist, uh, classified benthos into six important k types of benthic organisms. These would be haptobenthic or paraphytic, and that would, of course, correspond to the epibenthos, right? The lasion, the eubenthos, the nectobenthos, herpobenthos, and the salmon. The benthic uh, fauna has the highest diversity of all uh, groups of fauna in aquatic ecosystems. They're highly variable and high, highly biodiverse um, and very important to the functioning of aquatic systems. So the haptobenthos or, paraph or paraphytic animals are those that are attached to the substrate. And you, it, within there you'd see the sessile haptobenthos and the sub sessile haptobenthos. The sessile are those that are attached to the substrate only as adults. This will include things like uh, flagellated and ciliated protista, uh, protozoa, sponges that are attached, solenderates, things like um, hydra and so on, rotifers, a few of the stalk rotifers, and some bivalves, things like the zebra mussel, form byssus threads that attach them um, as adults to the substrate. The subsessile haptobenthos would be those that are attached intermittently that can move from place to place, and this includes some of the ciliates, the hydroids, which um, I'm sorry is misspelled here, um, that can detach and move, and a, a few mollusks and various insect larvae attach in the same sort, uh, can detach in that same sort of way and change where they live. The lasion are those animals living freely among the haptobenthos, and that would be sort of many species of protista, the turbolaria, um, the uh, uh, nemerata, the nematodes, some of the rotifers that work their way through um, the, um, uh, the haptobenthos, the attached flora and fauna, the gastrotrichs, oligochetes, 
the tardigrades would creep through that area, and most of the freshwater arthropods. Um, this is analogous to the terrestrial mammalian community sort of creeping through forest or through the grasslands. Um, so you could probably remember it that way. Those are the Lassian. The eubenthos, or the true benthos, I guess, um, in, um, in a way, are those motile animals that are usually bigger than the Lassian. Okay, so they tend to be um, sort of larger things. They don't leave the substrate. They're poor swimmers. Um, uh, some examples, um, oh well, would be, I suspect, the um, uh, freshwater mussels. They don't swim really at all. Um, you could even think of, let's say, a, um, um, a crayfish as being um, as a poor swimmer. It can move really quickly, but it doesn't swim as a regular, on a regular basis. Their linear dimensions are greater than the thickness of the hap haptobenthic algal growth, so they would kind of stick up and stick out. They move through or over the growth of haptobenthic algae on which they might feed. It includes all the gastropod mollusks, some insect larvae and some crustaceans like acellus. In many ways, because it's, it's called the eubenthos, this, you can guess, would be the most typical sort of benthic community. Nectobenthos. Nectos means swimming in Greek. Um, so this means the swimming benthos. These are motile swimming animals. And they're usually larger than the thickness of the haptobenthos. They move from place to place in the free water searching for food organisms. It's sort of analogous to birds living on bushes and trees. And this would include things like the leeches. You saw that leech sort of moving around hunting for invertebrates. Um, most of the benthic malacostrocan uh, crustacea, things like Clodocera and Copepoda, and lots of larval insects and some um, benthic fishes, especially those that are um, you know, like sculpins and so on that are very um, sort of oriented toward the substrate. They're the most numerous taxonomic group in the benthos. Um, herpobenthos, herpos, herpetos means creeping. Um, these are the animals living on or in the sediments and moving through it. And sometimes we call those the endobenthos. They're inside the benthos. They uh, in benthic environment. They live in fairly deep water, often below the vegetation line, down in the profundal zone, and they're very numerous and diverse. This would include things like chironomids sort of, and other larval insects, the pro some protozoans, the flatworms, nematodes, oligochaetes, and sort of the wormy things that dig through the sediments, crustaceans, and many of the bivalve mollusks if they're immersed into the substrate, usually found in the deepest parts of water bodies. Final group would be the salmon, and these are the sand dwelling fauna. They are the shallow water herpobenthos um, in, in the sediments, but in the shallow waters where there's sands. There's sands there, as we know from phys the physical limnology section. Um, there's sands because other materials have been washed away. These are very interesting fauna, and they develop in the sort of a triphasic substratum of the solid sands the liquids, or the water around it, and gas bubbles that live, that, that exist in the sand environment. So very interesting fauna and a somewhat um, less understood. So next I'd like to talk about more or less the um, various limnological aspects of the lentic benthos, since we now know what they are. And we'll talk about lake typology and, lent and the lentic benthos, seasonal variation, variation among environments and the depth distribution in general before we finish. So there are various uh, lake typological schemes that have been advance, advanced um, because people have noticed that um, oligotrophic, eutrophic, and dystrophic lakes have very different kinds of benthic organisms. In general, oligotrophic uh, uh, um, ecosystems tend to have a very diverse benthic um, benthic fauna. And it's dominated by those things that don't have problems with oxygen, things like tanny tarsus, that is to say, those things that don't have adaptations to very low oxygen. That'd be a tanny tarsus. We know Chaoberus that we saw a little while ago is well adapted to low oxygen concentrations. So oligotrophic um, typology would tend to be sort of a tanny tarsus dominated chironomid community. Whereas we move to eutrophic systems, and one thing that happens is that oxygen declines uh, very rapidly, and the um, sediments become saprobic. Um, uh, that, that is to say, they are very low in oxygen, they're anaerobic. And 
tends to have a more or less depauperate benthic community. But some of the things like chironomus that have um, have uh, c compounds that allow them to hang on to oxygen better than um, than others tend to be uh, very abundant there. And um, uh, Chaobarus can be present, of course, because it also has adaptations, the moving up and down through the water column and also its ability to deal with low, um, uh, low oxygen uh, concentrations. They, they tend to be abundant in those environments. In dystrophic lakes, so those are the ones that are usually brown water and have issues with sort of nutrients because of the binding of dissolved organic carbon. Uh, the sediments tend to be very peaty or very rich in organic matter. Often the water column is anoxic year-round, and they tend to have an e even more depauperate fauna. And um, it will either have uh, chironomus, the sort of the red heme-bearing um, uh, benthic um, midges, or none of them at all, uh, no chironomids. And chaobarus tends to be quite dominant. Basically, it can move up into and out of the um, uh, in the low oxygen um, low oxygen environment. The distribution of these organisms with depth is very different between oligotrophic, eutrophic, and dystrophic systems because in oligotrophic systems it tends to be fairly constant and this is all linked to sort of oxygenation and food availability. So deep water, shallow water, uh, very similar, much more similar abundances of um, uh, ab abundances of uh, um, of benthic organisms in eutrophic systems. As one goes down deeper and deeper and deeper, the abundance uh, of um, of benthic organisms is very much decreasing. So declining at very deep depth because there is really no oxygen there. Dystrophic lakes, it's very steeply decreasing. Probably benthic organisms more or less in the shallows and nowhere else. There's an effect of sediment organic matter um, in, um, in both uh, uh, depositional and non-depositional environments in the hypolimnetic zone and the epilimnetic zone. And this is from some interesting work from Lake Memphremagog and here, uh, in, in Quebec. And here we have the biomass of benthic organisms. And here we have epilimnetic waters on these first two bars over to the left. What we see here is lots of benthic organisms in what are called depositional environments. Depositional environments are those where you're depositing organic matter. Clearly there's much more food available in those depositional environments. In the non-depositional epilimnetic environments, the biomass is much of benthic organisms is much lower. Um, in fact, less than half that you find in the um, depositional areas. Uh, in the hypolimnion, down in the deeper waters, depositional areas again, where there's sediment being uh, being deposited, you have higher biomasses than you do in the non-depositional, sort of rocky areas, rock areas where there just isn't uh, a deposit of organic sediment. So both um, depth and uh, whether or not organic matter is deposited have both a very um, uh, important effect on how much um, uh, benthic fauna we find. This is from some old work by uh, by Brinkhurst, who shows the depth distribution uh, of um, number of species. This would be biodiversity here, number of species with depth in a variety of different lakes. And basically, overall, you can see the, the pattern. The littoral zone or shallow waters up here in the upper waters tend to have a lot more different species. But notice how many species there can be. Up to 30 or 40 species, and even in uh, in some systems I've worked on, I've seen much higher um, biodiversities in the in the littoral zone or the shallower parts of these lakes. Generally, because of the adaptations needed for low oxygen and, and um, different kinds of ways of living, um, the deeper waters have lower biodiversity, down sort of below, normally below about um, 10 or so species. Um, so the, the one big uh, outlier here would be Lake Neuchâtel in Switzerland, which is a very oligotrophic system and, um, and has a higher biodiversity in general for a variety of different reasons. Uh, this is the, um, the abundance of the benthos in a variety of different lake types. And these are just um, sort of schematic or stylized. And the things, I, this, uh, these are uh, lettered A, B, C, and D. And this is 
ultra-oligotrophic, oligotrophic, mesotrophic, and, um, and eutrophic. Uh, and so you see a couple of different things here, that in oligotrophic systems, there's a sort of a gentle decline in abundance. This would be in like numbers of organisms. And uh, in, in uh, sorry, in sort of the oligotrophic systems, you have high abundance constant for a while, declining as you get uh, to very deeper depths. But a couple of things happen then uh, that are a little bit different when you're in mesotrophic and eutrophic systems. You get a sort of a decline and then a re-increase and then a decline again. And the decline at intermediate depth in mesotrophic and eutrophic lakes is due to low light and primary production at that zone. And then uh, the abundance can increase in the lower waters because of the deposition of organic matter. Spatial distribution sort of horizontally in aquatic systems is also interesting. We see this in two different ways here. Here we have the littoral zone, the sublittoral, and the profundal zone. And this is numbers of species. And we're seeing the same thing again. This is for Zayerken in Denmark, or Lake Estrum in Denmark. Um, this is a eutrophic lake. The shallow waters where there's a high supply of light has a lot of different species in it, whereas the deeper waters out in the depositional area, the uh, deep waters where there's not um, as much primary production clearly, but simply a detrital rain falling down on the profundal zone, um, there are far fewer uh, species. Um, the num uh, so, um, so basically the numbers increase with biomass to an intermediate depth, and in deep waters biomass declines because anoxia favors smaller animals that grow slowly. Here we have biomass. In this lake, you see it peaking at sort of intermediate depth and numbers sort of generally increasing with increasing depth. So what this means is um, the uh, larger animals, um, lar the, the animals in the deeper waters are going to be very much smaller, uh, whereas the ones in shallow water uh, will represent more biomass per um, animal. So to summarize about the benthos, um, the, benthic in, uh, the benthic environment is dark and cold, especially compared to the pelagic zone, but it could be nutrient rich. It's also, uh, it also tends to be oxygen poor, at least in the deeper waters. Many taxa make up the benthos, but these are often dominated by insect larvae, and we see this in streams as well, and we'll get around to that in subsequent sessions. The benthos eat a wide variety and range of foods, but they are based on Many of them are based on detrital rain, be, uh, the d deposit of this sort of deposition of, um, of organic matter um, and that has to fall from the upper waters. Organisms can be attached, they can be free, they can be very mobile, and make up a, li a wide variety of life habits. Benthos have been used to type lakes in the past, and you can tell a great deal about functioning of a lake just based on the kinds of things that live on the, in the substrate-oriented fauna that we call the benthos. And finally, benthos distributions depend on depth and food resources, and depth for a variety of reasons, but also, uh, in, which includes oxygenation, of course, but uh, definitely on the detrital rain that tends to feed benthic environments.